My name is Inigo Montoya. You kill my functor. Prepare to die. Welcome to a Programming Languages Virtual Meetup pre-recording. My name is Connor Hookstra, and in today's video, we're going to be covering Chapter 3, Categories Great and Small from Category Theory for Programmers by Bartaj Maluski. This chapter has five subsections plus the challenges section at the end, and each of the subsections focuses on a category. So we're going to primarily focus on uh, 3.1, 3.2, and then the monoid sections. So starting off with 3.1, no objects, this is the entire subsection. So we'll read it and it says the most trivial category is one with zero objects and consequently zero morphisms. It's a very sad category by itself, but it may be important in the context of other categories. For instance, in the category of all categories, yes, there is one. If you think that an empty set makes sense, then why not an empty category? So I'm sure in later chapters, Bartage is going to have more to say about this, but good to know that there is a category of no objects. Moving on to simple graphs. The text reads, you can build categories just by connecting objects with arrows. You can imagine starting with any directed graph and making it into a category by simply adding more ar arrows. First, add an identity arrow at each node. Then for any two arrows such that the end of one coincides with the beginning of the other, in other words, any two composable arrows, a new, add a new arrow to serve as their composition. Every time you add a new arrow, you have to also consider its composition with any other arrow, except for the identity arrows and itself. You usually end up with infinitely many arrows, but that's okay. And the text goes on to read, another way of looking at this process is that you're creating a category, which has an object for every node in the graph and all possible chains of composable graph edges are as morphisms. You may even consider identity morphisms as special cases of chains of length zero. Such a category is called a free category generated by a given, a given graph. It's an example of a free construction, a process of completing a given structure by extending it with a minimum number of items to satisfy its laws. Here are the laws of category. We'll see more examples of it in the future. And I thought that these three paragraphs were extremely clarifying for some of the discussions that the meetup had been having over the first two meetings. So there had been a lot of discussion about whether a, a directed graph without the arrows that explicitly represent the composition of two arrows. So if you have uh, arrow A from, or if you have arrow F from uh, node A to B, and then arrow G from node B to C, do you explicitly need an arrow from uh, A to C that's called the composition of G and F? And some people were saying that you definitely explicitly need it. Others were saying that you can just define the arrow to be reachability. And basically what the text is saying here is that both are okay. So they're saying in one sense, you are looking at a graph and looking for all of the arrows. And if they're not there, then uh, you don't have a graph. In the other sense, if you have a free category, you can just add all the arrows you need and then end up with a category. So this is what Bartaj is doing here. He has the red arrows that he's added to the directed graph with the uh, nodes A, B, and C and the arrows F and G. And he has just gone ahead and added the identity arrows and the composition arrows and this is what's called a free category. And I like to think of this as a Build-A-Bear. Um, so you're basically given a graph or you know the uh, beginnings of a category, and then you need to add some stuff to it in order to officially sort of make it a category. Um, so free categories, whenever I hear this now, I'm just gonna think of Build-A-Bear. You need to add some stuff in order to end up with your final bear. Moving on to monoids. So this is probably the most interesting part of this chapter for me because I've heard quite a bit of about monoids from previous talks, which we're gonna see clips from. So the text reads, monoid is an embarrassingly simple but amazingly powerful concept. The text goes on to read, traditionally a monoid is defined as a set with a binary operation. All that's required from this operation is that it's associative and that there is one special element that behaves like a unit with respect to it. And they go on to give the example of the following. For instance, natural numbers with zero form a monoid under addition. Associativity means that a plus b in parentheses plus c is equal to a plus b and plus c in parentheses. In other words, you can skip parentheses when adding numbers. And the neutral element is zero because zero plus a is equal to a and a plus zero is equal to a. And they mention that because a is commutative, you can technically omit one of these additions. Um, but yeah, this is the book's explanation of a monoid. I personally don't think that this is a that this is a fantastic explanation because implicitly here it's basically stating three criteria a set of values aka a type a binary operation 
and a identity element, which they call uh, one special element that behaves like a unit with respect to it. So now what we are going to do is we are going to look at two different clips, one from Ben Dean's C++ Now 2019 talk identifying monoids, and another from David Sankel's CppCon 2020 talk entitled Monoids, Monads, and Applicative Functors. And I think these two explanations are not only fantastic, but in one of the cases, extremely entertaining. A monoid is basically three things. You've got a set of values, and that set in computer science usually is finite, but it might be a finite approximation to a conceptually infinite set in mathematics. You've got a binary operation, which is closed over the set. So when you, when you put two elements in, you get the thing of the same type out. And it, that operation has to be associative, notably it doesn't have to be commutative. That's kind of an optional add-on. And there's one special value in the set, which is the identity. Now, we're going to start taking a look at the first of our category theoretic concepts, which is called a monoid. So a monoid is a type in combination with a binary operation. A type T, some kind of binary operation, which is like a cross with a little circle in it. Now, the binary operation combines the values. Now, in order for a type combined with a binary operation to be considered a monoid, all you have to do is have these two properties. First, that operation needs to be associative. A op B op C is the same thing as doing B op C and then doing A op that at the end of it for every single value. Now, also, this type needs to have a special value E such that E op X is the same thing as X op E, which is just X. In other words, it's the identity operation. Uh, when you apply it to the, to the operation, you get this almost like an identity function. Does that all make sense to you? OK. Uh so obviously, David Sankel's clip with his kids is absolutely phenomenal. And you should definitely go watch both of these talks. But the one thing that I really, really like about Ben's talk is that he explicitly, in list form, lists out these three criteria: a set of values, a binary operation, and one special value in the set, aka the identity element. Because I'm a visual thinker, and I like lists. And when things are implicitly sort of stated that are a enumerated list of things, but in paragraph form, I think it's much nicer to have these in sort of bullet, bullet point form. So this was the first time that I really sort of wrapped my head around the idea of what a monoid was. And in both of these talks, they go on later to talk about uh, a specific case of monoids. So th this is just one of the examples from each of the talks. But Ben Dean mentions that, or I guess there's two on the slide with uh, Real numbers, addition and zero, you have a monoid. And real numbers, multiplication and one, you have a monoid. And then David Senkel makes the exact same point. Here he does it a little bit more colorfully, um, not in list form, but we have integer numbers or natural numbers. And then we also have uh, zero as our identity element and plus as our binary operation, and this forms a monoid. So absolutely fantastic talks. I highly recommend both of them. The links um, to these talks will be in the description of this video. And one thing that I want to point out on top of this is that we have our three criteria, so a type or a set of values, our binary operation, and an identity value. And for uh, the plus monoid for integers that we're looking at right here, this is sort of the um, object and arrow or object and morphism view of it. But in the Bartosz Maluski lecture 3.1, we have the following diagram where he has sort of this onion looking like uh, arrow and object with a bunch of circular arrows going back to it. And he mentions that this is a monoid. And this at first didn't really make sense to me, but that's because it's just a different way of looking at what we have on the screen. So the identity arrow is the inner arrow in the monoid over here. So these two map to each other. And then this arrow where you're just adding any other number other than zero, um, which I've done by an italicized n, is the representation of every other single arrow that you could possibly have. So these, this nested onion view is just saying that we have our identi identity morphism or identity arrow, which is just plus zero in this case. And then we have an infinite number of other arrows that we could have. And so I've just drawn it here with a single morphism with plus n where n can be anything. But you could also do it this way where you have one, two, three, two infinity. 
Um, so I was confused at first with this, but it makes sense once you think about it. And really, none of these are my mental model for monoids. My mental model of monoids is when writing reductions in programming. So this is Rust code. You have the reduction algorithm fold in Rust. And when you are calling fold, you have to pass it an identity element or identity value and a binary operation. And so my visualization or mental model is that we have sort of uh, two elements here that we're reducing into a single element and that this reduction is happening and being initialized with our identity value. And then it happens on a set of values or a type, which in this case is integers. So this was the first time sort of in my programming career when I started writing uh, std accumulates and by default, the identity value is zero and the default binary operation is plus, but you can overload that. And we actually saw this in last week's video. So when we were um, defining our factorial function in the final iteration of the sort of C++ 23 ranges version of this code, we were making a call to fold with std multiplies. So that's our multiplication binary operation and one as our identity value. So if you've been writing it, like hand rolled reductions, you may, might have accidentally or implicitly been, you know, writing the criteria for monoids without knowing it. And this speaks to exactly what Ben Deed said in his identifying monoids talk is that whether you want to learn about this stuff or not, it's there in your code. Moving on, there are two last things we should mention. One is that in the book, they talk about or introduce memt and mapend. So the text reads, in Haskell, we can define a type class for monoids, a type for which there is a neutral element called memt and a binary operation called mapend. So I'm not sure if this will come up later in the text, but it's, it's useful to know that memt is the neutral element, AKA the identity value, and that mapend is our binary operation. And the last thing I wanna highlight from the text is the following, where it reads, since the values of arguments are sometimes called points, as in the value of f at point x, this is called pointwise equality. Function equality without specifying the arguments is described as point-free. Incidentally, point-free equations often involve composition of functions, which is symbolized by a point, so this might be a little confusing to the beginner. And yes, when I initially found out that point-free programming was a lot of the time using composition of algorithms and the composition operator is the period in Haskell, it definitely seems like you're using more points than you would without point-free programming. Um, but here it's explaining why that is. So I thought it was worth highlighting. Moving on to the challenges section, we're gonna cover four of the exercises very quickly. So the first one reads, one, generate a free category from A, a graph with one node and no edges, B, a graph with one node and one directed edge, hint, this edge can be composed with itself, C, a graph with two nodes and a single arrow between them, and D, a graph with a single node and 26 arrows marked with the letters of the alphabet A, B, C, and Z. So visually, uh, this is what these look like. Note for the final one, I didn't draw all 26 letters because one, that's gonna be crazy, and uh, two, I don't have the time to animate uh, it that well. But we'll go through them one by one. So for A, a graph with one node and no edges, all you need to do is add the identity arrow and you're done. For B, a graph with one node and one directed edge, um, I've, I've seen multiple answers to this. I like the one that you don't need to do anything if you just consider that the arrow that exists gives you the identity arrow. Um, and composition is, you can compose it with itself, so it's fine. Others say that you have infinitely, um, you have to add an infinite number of arrows in order to make it a category, but I think both are correct due to the sort of uh, free category versus um, uh, non-free category, two perspective on things. C, a graph with two nodes and a single arrow between them. This one is pretty straightforward. Just need to add the identity arrow to both of our nodes. And then for the final one, we basically need to add the uh, composition of every single arrow with every other arrow from A to Z, which leaves you with infinite arrows. So A to B is one of them, and you need to continue to do this infinitely, which is gonna give you an infinite number of arrows. So I just drew a single one, but know that there are an infinite number of arrows in this solution. Moving on to exercise three. Considering that bool is a set of two values, true and false, show that it forms two set theoretical monoids with respect to, respectively, operator ampersand ampersand, which is logical and, and pipe pipe, which is logical or. Um, so the way I did this was to show it via APL code. So note that the hat uh, that looks like an A without the bar, that is logical and, and then the upside down hat, which looks like a V, is logical or. 
And you can see here um, from our operations uh, that we have our identity. So one of the really cool things about APL is that if you do a reduction on an empty array or empty uh, matrix, you get uh, the identity value. So the zero with the tilde through the middle of it basically is the empty array. And when you do an and reduction, you get the identity value one. And when you do an or reduction, you get the identity value zero. And the the four um, compositions uh, above basically are what you're going to get from the result of doing um, true and true, true and false, so on and so forth for each of each of ands and ors. Moving on to our second last exercise, number four, represent the bool monoid and the and operator as a category. List the morphisms and their rules of composition. So here I just created a simple table and uh, put a short statement. Single, the single object is the bool type. There are two morphisms, and false and and true. When composed, you get the following. So and true and and true gives and true, and then and false with anything else gives you and false. Pretty straightforward. And if you represent this using our little object and morphism um, diagrams, you get the following. So and true is the identity arrow and and false is uh, the other arrow. And whenever you compose uh, anything other than and true, the identity with itself, you're going to get end up with the and false arrow. And moving on to our final exercise, number five, represent addition modulo three as a monoid category. So we are going to do this using our object and arrow diagrams as we've seen up until this point. And this one's pretty straightforward. We have three arrows, uh, plus zero mod three is gonna be our identity. And then we have plus one mod three and plus two mod three. And any other number that is uh, lower or greater than zero, two, or one is going to end up giving you effectively uh, one of the arrows that is on our diagram currently. So this brings us to the end of the main coverage of chapter three. The only other thing that I wanna highlight is re-highlighting the two uh, slides that I showed from Bartosz Maluski's lecture 3.1, the one where he's constructing a free category and the one where he is diagramming a monoid with sort of the onion arrows. And the only, the only other thing that I wanna mention is that a few things were mentioned that are probably going to come up later. He mentioned homset, which is basically a set of morphisms. That's a useful term to know, and a couple others. So I definitely recommend watching the lectures. They're a great supplementary resource to the textbook. That brings us to the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed. I hope you learned something. Chapter three for me was a very clarifying chapter. It cleared up a bunch of things that I was a little bit confused about. And uh, yeah, I really enjoyed this chapter, and I'm looking forward to chapter four. So like I said, I hope you enjoyed. Have a great day, and I'll see you in the next video.